we are starting classification. So in class we did a little worksheet kind of introducing you to this idea that all the living things on earth are grouped into giant categories which we call kingdoms. So we're going to kind of go off of that. All right, here we go. Number one, taxonomy is a branch of biology that names and groups organisms together according to some characteristic that they share like feathers, scales, hair, making milk, things like that, and also their evolutionary history, which means how much DNA do they have in common with each other. The idea of taxonomy began more than 2,000 years ago with this dude right here, I'm going to give him red eyes, Woo. called Aristotle. Aristotle was a big thinker back in Greek times, and he decided to take every living thing on earth and group it into two categories, plants and animals. And that was all fine and dandy because, you know, they couldn't see all these little microscopic things, so they didn't know about bacteria and protists and such. But what do you do with a mushroom? That's a mushroom. Is that a plant or an animal? Well, probably most people would say it's a plant, but it's not. It's a fungus. But he didn't know that. So he decided, okay, well, this will work for now because, you know, what are you going to do 2,000 years ago? And he took the uh, animals because there's definitely much more diversity in animals than there are plants, and he decided to group them into smaller categories based on where they live, where they land, air, or water. Well, what do you do with a penguin? It spends half its time in water and half its time on land. I don't know. So it was an okay system to begin with, but not one that could last through the years. So why did the system not work so much? Well, for one, the common names of the animals that people said were different. You know, if I said one thing, uh, oh, did you see the whatever in my backyard? Well, they may be thinking one thing, like uh, there's lizards that are all over campus called bluebellies. Well, some people know it as blue belly, some people know it as a fence lizard. So because common names varied, we didn't know if we were talking about the same things. Two, the common names don't really describe the organism good enough. So what is this little thing? Oh, it kind of looks like a jellyfish. Well, it's neither jelly nor fish. It is an adarian, which is related to sea stars. So the common name doesn't describe this guy that well. Okay, so for example, what is this? Well, it's in the news lately. Up in Ranch Cucamonga, there's one uh, attacking and killing giant German shepherds. Well, some people might call this a cougar, a puma, a mountain lion, or a catamount. Um, there's one more. I can't think of what it is. But same idea. You know, I could say, man, there's this wild cougar in my backyard. And someone else goes, really? I saw a mountain lion in my backyard. Well, they don't realize you're talking about the same animal. Okay, so... Uh, a scientist, Carolus Linnaeus, his first name was Carol, um, Carol uh, Lin Linnine or something like that, but they turned his name into the form that we do with words by putting a U.S. on the end of them or A or an I. And so he said, you know what, um, the way you have it is great and all, but I bet you we could do this a little bit better. So he decided to use form and structure to categorize them. So looking, were they two legs or four legs? Did they lay eggs or have live birth? And so we started to group things together and he came up with what's uh, more common today, which is the system of the five kingdoms. But scientists, of course, we have to keep changing things because that's what we do. Scientists have decided the kingdom system wasn't that great, but they're actually going to go for something called domains. Domains is kind of like um, bigger than a kingdom, smaller than all living things on earth. So you will find something called domains used to describe all living things on earth. And there's three domains. One, eukarya. Two, archaea. And three, eubacteria. Okay, eukarya kind of sounds like the word eukaryote. And you are correct. That would be all the eukaryotes, including animals, plants, fungi, and protists. So this is a huge group. Now these two guys Together, they make up bacteria. I'm sorry about my writing. It's my pen. There's lag, and so it doesn't look like I can write. So these two guys are bacteria, but you, bacteria, are the true bacteria. These are the ones that we're familiar with, the ones that make us sick. These guys are funky. They live in crazy places that you would not expect anything to live, such as the hydrothermal vents down at the bottom of the ocean, or super acidic water baths, you know, crazy places. So these two, these two are together are the prokaryotes. So we have eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are broken into archaea, the archaic 
old bacteria or the U true new bacteria. Okay, so there's the domain level, but we usually go with kingdoms. This is our more traditionally commonly used system. And the kingdom goes through the five kingdoms here. We have bacteria, which can be split into the U bacteria and the archaea. And then we have these four right here, which are the eukaryo, caria, like that. And these are uh, protists, single-celled creatures, fungi, mushrooms, and mold, plantae, plants, and animalia. So these are the five main groups that we typically use, which we will mostly use here in class. Okay, so a little bit about each one. So the kingdom bacteria, so this is a kingdom, this is the domain. So kingdom bacteria, domain eubacteria. So the bacteria or eubacteria are prokaryote, which means no nucleus. They have a cell wall with a special chemical in it called peptidoglycan. And those are only found in bacteria. They're unicellular, but they can stick together in groups and clumps to look multicellular, but they function as individual units. They can be either autotrophic, make their own food, or heterotrophic, uh, meaning they have to get their food. Some examples of them would be strep, like strep throat, streptococcus, uh, staph, like Staphylococcus aureus, and E. coli or Escherichia coli. I like the names of bacteria. They have fun names. Okay, so here's some examples. Here's a, a needle that has a colony of bacteria growing on them, and here's some bacteria right here. I think they're cute. Okay, the next group uh, are the still under the bacteria group. So, whoop, I lost my thing. Oh, I lost my pen. Come on. We're, okay, my pen's not working. All right, so we have the archaea, which is um, kind of the domain, and archaea bacteria kind of go with the same. So these are all under the bacteria kingdom, but the domain archaea. They're also prokaryotes, but their cell walls do not have this funky thing called peptidoglycan, which is why the bacteria kingdom had to be separated into eukarya and archaea. They are still unicellular. They are still either autotrophic or heterotrophic. And some examples of them are these things called methanogens and halophiles. These are bacteria that make methane. And these are bacteria that love to live in really salty places, such as if you go to Yosemite, these cool pools that make all the different colors. And here's uh, some pictures of them right here. Okay, the next kingdom is Kingdom Protista but domain eukarya. The eukary refers to the part that it's a eukaryote. They all have cell walls of some sort. Some of them have cellulose in their cell walls, kind of like the plants do. And some of them have chloroplasts, which means that he is can be autotrophic. But the ones without the chloroplasts are heterotrophic. They can be unicellular. They can be uh, colonial, which means that they're they're unicellular, but they work together as one unit. Or they can be, oh, I can't spell, multicellular uh, creatures. So, like I said, they're either autotrophic or heterotrophic. Some examples, amoeba, paramecia, kelp, and slime molds. Let's see what those look like. Here's some. This little guy is called Volvox. This is a colony one. So these are individual little creatures all living together. This little guy, here's a, um, a euglena right here. So all these little creatures are all examples of protists. Pond water stuff. Then we have kingdom fungi, but domain eukarya as well. These guys are also eukaryotes. They have cell walls, but they don't have peptidoglycan. They have something called chitin, which is actually what we see in bugs as well. And these guys are usually mostly multicellular. There's a few unicellular ones like yeast. Yeast is only made out of one cell, but most of the time they're multicellular. They are heterotrophic, which means that, um, that they can eat food. And some examples of them would be mushrooms, yeast, and something cool called a puffball. Here are some examples of different mushrooms and fungi that we can find. They grow in all sorts of different cool shapes and colors. That one looks something like a dessert, something you can eat. Then we've got the plants, kingdom plantae, or domain eukarya. They, so that means they're also eukaryotes. They have cell walls made out of cellulose. They all have chloroplasts. They're all multicellular. They're all autotrophs, with the exception of a Venus flytrap, who's autotrophic, but can supplement his food with uh, being heterotrophic as well. 
Examples, ferns, mosses, trees, and flowering plants. So here's some ferns right up here. Here's some mosses. And then over here, we've got cone-bearing plants as well. I don't have any flowering plants on this one. And then we have the biggest group of them all, which are the uh, kingdom animalia, which is the domain eukarya, still eukaryotes, but no cell walls or chloroplasts. We're all multicellular, we're all heterotrophs, and it includes everything from sponges to weird worms, insects, fish, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, tons of stuff. So here kind of shows the, um, the groupings. Everything over here from here to here are things without backbones. Here's things with backbones. As you can see, not a big category. The things with backbones can be broken into fish, birds, reptiles, mammals, and amphibians. And then all the rest, we'll get into this a little bit later. Okay, so in taxonomy, we group things into big categories like kingdom animalia, but then we want to group it into smaller and smaller categories until we end up with the actual animal. And that's where this hierarchy comes into play. We have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And so kings play chess on fine green sand or whatever you want to tell yourself to remember it. Tells you from the biggest category all the way down to the smallest. So here's a honeybee right here, which he is multicellular and heterotrophic, so and he has no cell walls, so he's an animal. He's got um, a exoskeleton and segmented legs, which puts him in the arthropod category. He has three body segments and six legs, which puts him in the insect category. He has a stinger and two pairs of wings, which puts him in the hymenoptera category. He looks like a bumblebee or a bee of some sort that puts him into the family apidae. He is a type of honeybee that makes honey, so he is apis, and this particular species is called mellifera. So as you can see, I started with all the animals in the world and got it down to just this guy. So usually we refer to the scientific names of living creatures by both their genus and their species name. So humans are homo sapiens, um, your dog is canis domesticus, your cat is uh, catus uh, familiaris, and so we all have these cool fancy Latin two names in order to name us. So we call that binomial nomenclature, two names, binomial two names. So Linnaeus, the guy who did all this way back when, said, well, let's just give two names to everybody. So he alone named over 11,000 species of plants and animals. Crazy. So genus and species. By doing this, he also figured out who was related to who. When you write out a genus and a species, the genus is always capitalized, and, oh, I said domesticus, is familiar, and the species is usually always a lowercase. If you write it, you underline it. If you type it, you italicize it. That's how you can always find um, a scientific name quickly, because you look for the um, italicized. Oh, here we go. Genus and species names must be underlined if written, italicized if typed. The names are in Latin, so worldwide they will be the same. So remember that cougar and the catamount and the panther? Well, I can go to any country in the world and talk to any scientist, and if I say felis concolor, they know exactly what animal I'm talking about. Because if I say puma, they're like, hey, uh, catamount, hey, cougar, huh? But if I say felis concolor, they go, oh, big furry cat, yeah, 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 yeah. And what I like about the names is they are basically just Latin descriptions. So Felis Concolor means cat of many colors. Um, Homo sapiens means um, same brain, same knowledge. Um, there's some just really funny ones. Um, Maricarpa Macrocarpa means cup, cup, big cup. So some of them are really stupid. But they... they um, tell you exactly what you need to know about it. Apis mellifera, the, the bee, just means um, the bee that brings sweet things. Honey. So I think, I always like the Latin names. I think they're kind of fun. Um, sometimes if you discover a new species, you can have your name be put into it. Uh, I think Lady Gaga was the last one who got her name put into some new species that's been discovered. It's kind of crazy. Um, okay, last little bit, and then we're done. Because there's so much variation with organisms, sometimes we have to add additional levels. Um, subs or supras, subspecies, superspecies, um, subclass, 
super class and so we have lots of variety we're going to stick with just the seven but just know that you can have varieties and subspecies botanists because they can mix pretty much any flower with any flower and make new kinds um, they call these things varieties so that's what botanists use plant people so like uh, peaches and nectarines are the same plant but if you do some cool stuff to it I can make them make different fruits uh, even though genetically it's 100% the same plant. So they call these two different varieties. And then with animals, uh, we call those subspecies. So two of the same species that live in different areas probably won't ever run into each other. And so uh, we would write the genus, you know, Felis concolor concolor, or Phoenus concolor rebergii, or something cool like that. So, well, we're, we don't deal so much with this. Okay, I think that's about it, so I will see you tomorrow. Goodbye.